A lot of people don't like the teaching on karma because it sounds fatalistic. You did something bad in the past, you're going to have to suffer now. The irony, of course, is that the Buddha said that that was one of the worst forms of wrong view there is. The way he taught karma was a lot more complex and offered a lot more room for freedom of choice and also freedom to not suffer. Because after all, that's the whole purpose of his teachings, to teach you how not to suffer, no matter what your past karma is. As he pointed out, there's past karma and there's present karma. And our experience of the present moment is a combination of both. You've got the results of past karma coming in, you've got the intentions you're making right now, and then the results of those intentions right now. All of those together create your present experience. They can't do much about your past karma. What's done is done. But the way you take the potentials that come from past karma and shape them into a, your experience of the present moment, that's a skill that can be mastered. This is why we meditate, why meditation focuses on what the mind is doing in the present moment. And it focuses on the three things that we are in a good position to adjust in the present moment, the three kinds of fabrication. There's bodily fabrication, the breath, verbal fabrication, directed thought and evaluation, in other words, the way you talk to yourself. You choose a topic and then you comment on it. And then mental fabrication, your perceptions, the labels you apply to things, the images you apply. And then feelings, feelings of pleasure and pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And these are all things that we can adjust in the present moment, so that no matter what the potentials coming in from the past are, we don't have to suffer from them. It's like being a good cook. The best cooks are the ones who don't have to have only these special ingredients in order to make good food. Whatever is in the refrigerator, whatever is in the pantry, they can make something good out of it. So as you're meditating, you're learning to be a good cook. You focus on the breath, and you realize there are lots of different ways of breathing. You can breathe in ways that are constricted and unpleasant, or you can breathe in ways that are more wide open, more nourishing. And so why choose the constricted ways? Well, it's because usually we're not paying attention, we're thinking about something else. So here we're going to think about the breath. That's when we bring in the verbal fabrication. Keep your attention directed to the breath and then comment on it. Does it feel good? If it doesn't feel good, what would feel better? Longer, shorter, faster, slower, deeper, more shallow, heavier or lighter? When you find a rhythm that feels good, maintain it as long as it feels good. And then when you can maintain it, then you think of it spreading through the different parts of the body, because you're trying to get a state of mind where your awareness fills the body, a sense of ease fills the body as well. A sense of fullness fills the body. So how do you take that place in the body where things feel good and let it spread? Well, you think of the different blood vessels and the different nerves, there's a big network that goes out to the pores of the skin. And you're aware of the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out, and you try to think of it all melding together, working in harmony. And then you're aided in this by your perceptions, the images you hold in mind. So what image do you have of the breath? You can think of it as the air coming in and out through the nose. Or you can think of it as the energy flow, the flow of energy through the blood vessels, the flow of energy through the nerves. Hold that image in mind and see what it does to the way you breathe. And where are you in relationship to the breath? 
sometimes there's a tendency to feel that we're outside of the body a little, a little bit, looking in. But you have to remember, the breath is all around you. All too often we say, watch the breath, when you actually should be, feel the breath. Allow the breath to bathe you. Hold that image in mind. As you breathe in, it's coming down not only the front of the body, it's going down the back of the body, it's going down the sides, all the way down to the toes. It's all around you. Hold that image in mind. See what that does. So these are your cooking skills. The Buddha himself makes this analogy. He says, the wise cook knows his master. He doesn't have to wait until the master says, I'd like more of this. The cook notices, does the master eat more salty food or eat more sweet food? Sour, bitter, bland. Whatever the master likes, you make more of that. And you get a reward. It's because you're observant. And John Lee adds another detail to that image, noticing that sometimes the master likes one food one day and another food another day. So you have to keep changing your offerings. If it's porridge today, porridge tomorrow, porridge the next day. The day after that, the master's going to get a new cook. So as a good cook, you have to be both observant and ingenious, which are the two qualities that are and John Fung used to say, are really necessary in the meditation. You have to be observant and you have to use your powers of ingenuity. When things aren't working, what would work better? When things have been working, how do you maintain them? So this is how the teaching on karma applies to the meditation. There's some things that come in from the past that you can't do much about. Other times there's plenty of room for adjustment. The Buddha noted one time there are three kinds of disease. There are the diseases that whether you take medicine or don't take medicine, you're not going to recover. There are the diseases where whether you take medicine or don't take medicine, you will recover. And then there are the ones that w where you recover if you take medicine, but not if you don't. And as he said, it's because of that third type that you give medicine to all three. Because you really never know ahead of time which category your disease is going to fall into. In other words, in some cases, the karma coming in from the past is pretty bad. There's not much you can do to change the physical condition in the present moment. In other cases, it's not all that bad at all. You don't have to do much, it's going to go away on its own. Where the skill is most useful is where your skill in the present moment will make a difference. And even in cases where you can't make much of a difference in terms of the body coming in from the past, as long as you have your wits about you, you can make a difference in the mind. That's where the Buddha's medicine focuses. The Buddha is often compared to a doctor. Four Noble Truths are compared to medicine, or the doctor's approach to treating a disease. There's the diagnosis, suffering, then there's the analysis of the cause. And then there's the prognosis that this, this disease can be cured. And then there's the course of treatment, the Noble Eightfold Path. So we're here to cure, cure the, the diseases of the mind using the breath. To at least help alleviate some of the symptoms of the body in the present moment, but also to give the mind a good place to stay. Then you use your directed thought and evaluation, you use your perception, so you create feelings, the kind of feelings that you can maintain. These are not the ordinary feelings that just arise and pass away willy-nilly. They're the feelings you give rise to as you learn how to breathe, and learn how to breathe properly, learn how to focus on the breath. And then you can maintain them. After all, this is the duty of Mindfulness, when it becomes a governing principle, we're all too often told that mindfulness is all about seeing things arising and passing away. But when something good arises, you want to 
hasn't arisen, you want to make it arise. Once it's there, you want to make sure it doesn't pass away. That's what mindfulness is for. So these are some of your cooking skills, the skills you use here in the present moment, so that no matter what's coming in from the past, you don't have to suffer from it, because after all, that is the essence of the Buddhist teachings. He didn't teach the end of suffering only to people who, were, who had exclusively good karma. He said, look, if you're suffering, here's the end. Here's the way to the end, regardless of what your past karma is. If you can create good karma in the present moment, okay, you can put it into suffering. You have that choice. Another reason why when the Buddha, who ordinarily wouldn't look for people who would, he would argue with, did go out and argue with people who said you didn't have freedom of choice in the present moment. You do have that choice. You can develop these skills. So that even though there's pain in the body, the mind doesn't have to suffer. The world outside can be crazy, but the mind doesn't have to suffer. If you're able to put it into suffering only after the world became perfect, it would never happen. So here we are trying to find some perfection inside in the midst of this imperfect world. And it is possible to attain. You can perfect your cooking skills. So when you go into the kitchen, no matter what's in the pantry, you're going to make something good.